thank you very much, everybody, uh, for joining us tonight. We have a special guest who is apparently a neighbor of Richard, but neither one of them know about it because she is from Denton, Texas. And uh, her name is Kayla Olson, and she's written her first not young adult book. <laughs> is that correct? <laughs> That's correct. Yes. And I am here in Denton, so I'm close to all a lot of you. Um, I didn't even yes. know we were until today. <laughs> yeah. Well, we, we, we like to hide out here in North Texas, I guess. Um, yeah. So welcome, Kayla. It is really nice to see you. Why don't you tell us a little bit about how, about yourself and how you got started writing? Sure. So my name's Kayla. I have been a lifelong reader, my, just for as long as I can remember. And for so many years, I just devour books. I was a big fan of the Babysitter's Club when I was little. <laughs> and I just like, I inhaled them every day and just moved on to more books and more books, anything I could get my hands on. But I never really tried or considered writing one until after college. Um, my major, I went to UNT and I, I majored in international studies. Didn't take even any English because I tested out of it in school. Um, I loved it so much in high school but then I was just like oh, I want to graduate quicker anyway so I didn't even know I wanted to start writing until there was a time um, where I finally read the entire Harry Potter series which was right after college <laughs> um, and then I was also watching Lost which by the way is the show that I would reboot <laughs> um, and both of those you know the book series and then the TV show, they just had so many amazing characters and interesting plot threads and cliffhangers and backstories. And just, I, I thought it looked like such a fun challenge to try and write um, a novel. So around 2009, I, I was working at a Starbucks right here in Denton by the mall <laughs> and um, just really feeling creatively unfulfilled with, with everything and thought, um, you know, it's, it's a good job to be able to stand here and give coffee and talk to people and be kind, but I feel like there's this whole other side of me that's creative and analytical and, um, disciplined and patient and, um, I love words. So I thought, you know, I think I want to sit and like, try to make something out of that part of myself. Um, so I started writing in 2009 and never stopped. <laughs> um, I briefly took a hiatus while I had a baby. Um, I was very sick while I was pregnant and then he was a lot of work for a long time, but came back to it. Um, my first projects were good practice projects. And then I finally got my literary agents in 2014. The, the book that I signed with them on did not sell, <laughs> but then I wrote the book that did, which was called The Sandcastle Empire. It was a young adult book, um, sci-fi survival novel set on a desert island. Um, and then I had a second young adult novel set on a space station. I like to think of it as a murder mystery in space. That's kind of like um, one of us is lying meets the hundred. Um, and then when the pandemic hit, um, real life became a little too close to the fiction I was writing. And um, I did not care to spend all my time thinking about how bad the world could get in the future. <laughs> um, and I was reading a lot of romance novels at the time and adult romance instead of young adult and rewatching Boy Meets World <laughs> with my husband because we were looking for something happy. <laughs> um, and one day this idea just popped in my head that it might be fun to write a book about two teen actors who were very, very close friends off camera and then had to play love interests on screen for the whole world to see. Um, and I didn't feel like setting it like in the time when they were actually going through those, those feelings, like as teenagers, I thought it would be more fun to just fast forward like 15 years and write an adult version of that story when they come back together and relearn each other. So, um, my pandemic project was my happy place. Uh, <laughs> it, it was a guaranteed happy ending with fun settings like a beach sunsets and uh, Hollywood and red carpets. It was just the most fun place I could imagine during a really stressful time. So um, I pivoted from young adult science fiction survival to adult romance and I 
couldn't be happier that I did. So. <laughs> wow. So, I mean, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of scenes like in the, at least in the beginning of the book and everything else, because you keep, you keep going between, um, I don't know whether they're blog posts or they're, mm -hmm. they're kind of like entertainment tonight, little pieces, I guess is the best way that I know of putting it. So have you actually yourself experienced any like red carpets or things like that? Or how did you do the research for that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, a lot of my, um, experience in that world is all aspirational. <laughs> I've never experienced it myself. Um, my first book did have a film deal attached to it with Leonardo DiCaprio and Paramount. Um, that has since been canceled, but I learned a lot just about how like, you know, movies are made and all the processes leading up to it and how the contracts mm -hmm. work and, um, both of my literary agents live in Los Angeles and my editor is also from Los Angeles, even though she lives in New York now. And so with, you know, with all of their input combined with my research, just based on various internet searches and um, other shows that have been about Hollywood and um, various reading that I've done over the years, I think I've just consumed a lot of entertainment media <laughs> throughout the course of my life. And so, um, had a lot of just uh, people steering me in the right direction whenever like in my first drafts they didn't have trailers they were in dressing rooms and my editor was like oh you know I think they would have trailers on a film set I was like yeah you, I think you're right you know so little details like that kind of solidified throughout the process of revision but a lot of it was just how I imagined it to be based on just kind of what I had observed through many years on the internet, just reading about that world. Um, and I've been very pleased, like uh, my audiobook narrator, she sent me a message when she was recording the book and she was like, have you worked in Hollywood before? Have you worked on a TV set? And I was like, no. Um, and she said, because it feels really, really accurate. Like she's she's been in that world and I've gotten messages from other people and other like, reviews saying the same thing like they they work in Hollywood or they work as an actor and they felt like it was very authentic to their experience and so I was very happy to hear that because having not lived it myself I didn't know for sure until other people who had lived it had feedback so yeah because it was really interesting to me because um well Gwen who's not here tonight has done entertainment reporting and I've watched her on the red carpet and I've watched Preston on the red carpet and it's like always it's always fascinating like the behind the scenes and just sitting and watching it and not exactly what you see if you're watching you know the the red carpet before the Grammys or the Oscars or whatever but like in a smaller kind of situation it's just you really did nail it you really did it was uh it was very, very good. So what made you, I mean, you said that, that the reason that you set the reunion in you, okay, this is a grown up book versus being a young adult book. All right. We're just going to call it that. <laughs> um, and so this is, this was, um, what, what really made you, why didn't you pick like some, some other kind of setting like coffee shop or something like that? What made you go to something that you weren't exactly, uh, you know, you have done it before in real life kind of thing. Yeah. Um, I have a big imagination, I guess. I, I think that forever I was, I've always been fascinated with Hollywood. And like when I was little, I always wanted to be a singer um, or an actress. And my whole family, like everybody knew who knew me was really surprised that I went to writing books instead of singing and making music. Um, and so yeah, you know, when we moved, when I was a kid, I was like, oh, are we moving to New York? Are we moving to Los Angeles? And my parents were like, no, we're moving to Mason, Texas in the hill country. <laughs> and that's about as far away from Hollywood as you can get. So I think um, when, when I was watching Boy Meets World and I had this idea of like the two teen actors um, just having that tension between like, are we best friends or are we more? It just felt like a natural setting to explore and just a fun place to visit in my head. Like part of why I was drawn to it was because I had never lived it. Um, uh, and so 
it was fun to imagine what it might be like. Um, whereas I could probably write a coffee shop book though. I think my agent would probably love that. <laughs> She's, mm -hmm. she told me that she, she'd love me to write like a really cozy vibe book at some point. And I'm like, a coffee shop book would be pretty fun, but. <laughs> Well, I was, I was on your website and reading things about you. So what was the, you did a lot of little jobs, well, little jobs are not little guys, uh, but a lot of different jobs, mm -hmm. everything from Chick-fil-A to being at Starbucks. And maybe I got my coffee from you up there in Denton by the uh, mall. I don't sure. know, but I used to stop at that Starbucks when I would go up for it to visit um, Denton. So yeah, who knows? That was yeah. the pandemic. Yeah. <laughs> it's been a little while. Um, I, um, yeah, I did. I worked several jobs because my major in college was international studies, mostly because I went like the, pra what I thought was going to be a more practical route. Um, I've always been just a creative person with a lot of different interests and I went to UNT expecting to be a music major, but changed my mind before I ever started because I wanted to keep loving it instead of like making a job out of it. So I was actually in the UNT Jazz Singers for all four years and that was my um, my musical outlet while I was there. Um, and <laughs> because I loved so many things, it made it really hard to narrow in on one thing to focus on. And so I, I really enjoyed all my history and my political science classes. And so I thought, okay, that could be interesting for a little while. I thought maybe I would go like be a missionary somewhere or like join the Red Cross or do something like that international, like humanitarian type stuff. Um, and then I ultimately decided I didn't want to move overseas <laughs> and also didn't want to work in Washington, uh, which felt like the only options of time for an international studies major who wasn't completely fluent in any foreign language. <laughs> I have a lot of little pieces of foreign language. All that to say, after college, I really had no idea like how to turn my major into a job. <laughs> um, so I ended up working just to like pay the bills while I figured it out and applied for other things. And so at first, let's see, what was the first one? I think it was bank. No, it was Chick-fil-A. I worked at Chick-fil-A for a little while um, while I did like a Bible study year long, like almost seminary program. Um, so I just had a job to pay my bills while I did that, like post-college studying. And then the manager of the bank across the street, like poached me <laughs> from Chick-fil-A because he was like, okay, you're really fast and you're friendly and you seem accurate with your stuff. Come work at the bank, we'll pay you more. <laughs> and I was like, okay. Hmm. So I worked at the bank, Bank of America for like two years, right across the street, um, right down there on Swisher Road in Corinth and um, hated it. <laughs> mm. I, I liked it at first, but um, then the manager changed. And so I thought for a while that maybe I would like pursue a career in banking. And, and eventually I learned like, this is not the world that I want to be part of every day of my life. Um, it felt just so cyclical um, to where like everything just started over at the beginning of each day and you never really made progress <laughs> with anything. And it just felt like the same thing over and over and the whole world was just kind of negative. So I stopped that when I got married because <laughs> um, our premarital counselors gave us really good advice of like, um, base your, base your budget on one person's income. And that way, like if one of you gets sick or like can't work, then you won't be in a big bind later. And so I went ahead and I took that advice. I quit that job because I hated it so much, um, and never looked back, but, um, and we were like on a tiny, tiny, like shoestring budget for many years because of that decision, but it ultimately freed me up to, to write when I uh, wanted to, because there was nothing writing on whether I succeeded at it or failed. <laughs> um, I ended up working at Starbucks also because I was just a customer there and the manager had interviewed somebody right next to my table while I was just reading. <laughs> and then when that person left, the manager was like, hey, do you want to work here? Um, I can get you free coffee and you're in here all the time. 
And I was like, okay, um, I can't work nights and I can't work weekends and I can't work these holidays. <laughs> She's like, done. So I ended up working there for about a year and a half and it was really, really fun. But I ultimately stopped um, just because I wasn't getting a lot of hours and the hours I was getting were like at six in the morning till nine. And then I was tired the whole day. So yeah. I started and here we are. <laughs> so uh, from all of those, like those, because they're kind of customer service, customer relations, did you pick up little stories from, because I'm always from the interactions and the people that you got to watch the customers and things like that. How, how has that fed into your writing and into yeah. your creation? I can't remember like specific ones um, throughout the years, but I do remember the feeling of like in customer service, especially when you work like an eight hour shift, you see, I was on the drive through all the time and like all three of these jobs. And so I would see, just have all these little 30 second interactions over and over and over which was part of why it just wore me down as a person because that is taxing. <laughs> um, but the way that I maintained my empathy for these people was like remembering, okay, I see them for 30 seconds of their day. For the rest of the day, they are the main character in their story. And they have this whole life that I know nothing about. Like they're just a side, side, side character in my life <laughs> uh, for these 30 seconds that I see them but I have the opportunity to affect their day, you know, by being kind and trying to set it off on a happy, happy note, you know, but seeing that many people just really made me realize like how many people have so much going on that we will never know about. Um, we just see the tip of the iceberg of people. And so when I create, you know, I, I kind of brought that into my writing by thinking, um, you know, whether a character is a main character or like a main side character, or they just appear for like half a page, I need to write them as though they are a fully fleshed out character who could be the, the center of their own story. So I need to know them that well um, in order to make them feel authentic for their just tiny little bit part on the page. <laughs> so it definitely did affect my writing in that way, I felt like. So... So do the characters live in your head when you're writing or dreaming or how do you, how do you form your characters? Yeah, I, that is a, a fascinating question that I, having done this for so many years, I still don't even fully understand how it works because like, they'll just come to me and I feel like I know them. And the more that I write them, the more, the clearer a picture of them I have in my head. Um, like, I feel like even after reading this book so many times, they in revision, you know, like they're still very real to me in my head. It's hard to picture their faces exactly. Like, I don't know if that's just a me thing or if many authors are like this, but um, they just feel like fully formed people in my head. And when I'm writing them, I'm just kind of like un uncovering them a little bit piece by piece. Um, and sometimes I learn more about them in revision <laughs> where I think, okay, well, in the book, my main character Liv, she's a very, very private person. And she, one of her fears is like, she, she's afraid to form a relationship that's very public because there's a lot of pressure on it. And, and so as I did revision, it's like, well, why is she like this? You know, what in her past has created this like intense need for privacy? And so it kind of helped shape the backstory of her father, who was a famous Hollywood actor, but his death was ultimately caused by a paparazzi car chase, like inv just this invasive nature of, of the paparazzi on his life, you know? And so um, there's as much as she loves the art of her job, like she doesn't love the um, invasive aspect where she's just out in front of people all the time. And a lot of that just stems back to, you know, how it really affected her life in a very personal way. So I think, um, you know, that's an example of just how I would start with like how I want the character to be, but then I have to do more research to figure out like, okay, what shaped them in that way? Why would these beliefs be held so strongly? Um, so it, it's always so much fun to just like figure that out and put the pieces together. Okay. All right. Well, we're going to move now into what we call the fresh fiction facts. I don't want you to just be scared, Okay. but, but 
you have to answer it really fast off the top of your head. Yes, to have a have a good sip there because you're like the lightning round. <laughs> yes, it's like the lightning round. You got this right. Okay. So what was your favorite TV series? Oh, Dawson's Creek. <laughs> Very good. Would you like to see a reunion of that? I would love to see that reunion. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. What do you own a ridiculous amount of? And you can't say books. <laughs> coffee mugs coffee mugs I have a favorite ceramicist she's also a Texan and I signed up for her mug box like five years ago and she sends out a mug of the month every month you pay just a flat fee and she surprises you and none of them are the same and they all go together and I probably have like 50 <laughs> but I love her she's wonderful and so I just I keep subscribing because I want to support her small business. So I, I give them away to a lot of people now, but I love them. I have so many books. <laughs> oh, you have to, you have to share that information with us because there's others who have a yes. mug addiction. Okay. But I think I beat you. I've got over almost 700 mugs. Oh my goodness. Do you really? Yeah. Yes. And, and, and we had to put some of them away. So it's really, you know, I, I am not allowed to get a new mug without taking an old one and putting it in storage, but I refuse to, you know, get rid of them completely. I, yeah. you know, yes. I know the thing. I, I relate to this in my core. Yeah. yeah. Okay. What is your favorite genre to read? Right now it's romance, um, like romantic comedy with heart and substance. Um, I love like Emily Henry's books. Uh, she's written some of my favorites for sure. I gravitate sometimes toward mysteries and thrillers, but I haven't read lately, so. Okay, what is the genre that you never want to read again? Oh gosh, Oh. I don't gravitate a lot to historical, <laughs> um, but I will read it. Um, I don't know. Oh, the only kind of books I would not read are probably ones that are extra, extra like horror, <laughs> scary, <laughs> demonic <laughs> kind of like creep into your soul and make you like have a hard time sleeping. I probably would not pick that up. <laughs> Okay. I, I can understand that. I don't like horror yeah. myself. Yeah. Pretty whatever yeah. Has, has a compelling voice and uh, I'm hooked with by the character. Okay. Do you uh, listen to music when you write? As such a musical person, I cannot mm -hmm. listen to music or else I'll start singing along. Or even if it has no words, like my brain will just catch on the melody or the beat. <laughs> So about 10 years ago, maybe 12 years ago, I started writing to Thunderstorm soundtrack. Um, it's the perfect white noise to kind of drown out coffee shop chatter or my, my child asking my husband something, you know. Um, I, I use noise canceling headphones and then just have the Thunderstorm track in there. And it's, it's a great, just like at this point, it's almost like Pavlovian. <laughs> as soon as I turn it on, I'm like, okay, I'm focused now. So I've, I've listened to that thunderstorm for years. <laughs> well, you know, that's supposed to put you to sleep. <laughs> yeah. That's what they, was really that's what they, you know, at this point, I, it would, it would probably still work <laughs> if I was in the right setting. I fall asleep pretty easily these days, but um, it was really weird to try to write a, a book set on a space station to that thunderstorm track because there's no rain mm -hmm. in space and I tried like airplane noise and other white noise and it just, I, it couldn't. <laughs> and that's when I realized I was hooked. So definitely thunderstorms. Uh, so you dedicated this book to a bunch of Emily's. How did you come up with all these Emily's? Do you not know anybody by any other name? <laughs> you know, my very best friends are both Emily and um, one I call writing Emily and one is tennis Emily. And um and I wanted to dedicate one to each of them. And I was like, well, maybe if I just throw a whole bunch of Emily's in there, I can, <laughs> you know, make a thing out of it. And, uh, and the other Emily's are equally like wonderful, but these two 
particular Emily's like the first two listed are part of my every single day life and like I I couldn't get through it without either one of them. And so um, I thought it'd be a really fun, special thing to make an Emily page. And I have a book that I've been taking around to all my signings uh, where people can like sign my guest book uh, so that I have a souvenir. And I was like, if your name is Emily, please sign on the dedication page because that is your page. (laughs) But so that is really sweet. That is very sweet. Okay, which character from any of your books would you most want to be friends with? I think Bree, who is my main character in this book's personal assistant slash best friend. Um, She is just the most loyal, energy, like energetic, thoughtful friend you could want. Um, I think almost like to her demise like she could stand to think about herself more but she's a really just thoughtful person who who knows like how to listen really well and doesn't um press for more information than live the main character is um is ready to part with so especially since my main character is such a private person she doesn't let a lot of people into her circle of trust easily and Brie has just really proven herself to be a supportive friend who walks that line really well of like helping her in her professional life, but also being there for her as a personal friend, but not like pushing for her to do too much. So I think she'd be a really good friend. <laughs> That's good. Okay. And what is the favorite distractions that you, that you allow to take yourself away from writing? tennis I am a huge tennis player now I was not always um I considered myself extremely uncoordinated and not athletic um until I was 35 (laughs) and then my son was taking tennis classes and they had adult beginner classes at the same time and um we my husband and I were like, okay, we'll try it. But we were the only two in the beginner class. And so we felt like, okay, we signed up for three times a week and it's just us. So I guess we better try, like show up. So the coach doesn't show up with no class. Um, So at first it was just like this whole discipline of like letting myself be uncomfortable in a situation where I was terrible at something. Um, Like it was kind of freeing to be able to fail at something that had nothing riding on it because I'm a perfectionist and I like everything well on the first try so it was a personal challenge to like put myself out there (laughs) but fast forward a few years and I am just like obsessed and addicted to tennis I play like five or six times a week now and I'm on three teams I'm the captain of one of those teams and so it's it's become a huge part of my life um that is a wonderful contrast to writing um just because with writing you never really know how it's working until months or years down the line when you can reread it again (laughs) and with Mm -hmm. tennis I hit that ball it's in or it's out (laughs) and I can do this better or you know I need to work on this or that so it's just also just like a good physical release just to to move around yeah I was gonna say it's a very good physical release for because writers always have a problem like they're just sitting and writing all the time my coach was like you do with your time before you played tennis I was like I don't know I think I just read a lot (laughs) yeah okay so you're not that old but what advice would you give to your youngest self my youngest self um I would probably tell my youngest self to not worry about being a tall, curly headed, musically inclined person who loves algebra and books. <laughs> um, and the things that make me feel different are also the things that make me unique. And that, um, you know, I was self conscious about all those things when I was mm-hmm. in school, when I was in middle school, especially. Um, and it made for a lot of lonely years because I went to a small school where I didn't relate to a lot of people. And I think if I um, could look back on that, I would tell myself like, hey, you, it's fine. Like those years made me just a more well-rounded person, more empathetic person and like sensitive to people who might be lonely (laughs) um, or might feel like they don't always fit in. And so um, 
tell myself probably like the hard times are hard for a reason, but you know, you'll get through them and good things will come out of it. Oh, that's great advice. Thanks. Okay. So what are you working? What is the next thing we can expect from you? Yes. Yeah, so I had hoped to be able to speak more specifically about what's next, but um, all I can say right now is that I'm writing another adult romance um, and hopefully I'll have news to share on that front soon. Um, so I'll announce uh, any news um, on Instagram or on my website. So Facebook sometimes too. <laughs> Which is, which is our last question is how can readers stay in touch with you? So obviously Instagram, your website, go ahead. Tell us what it is. Um, I, I'm most active on Instagram. It's my favorite of the social medias and the ones that I, one that I feel most natural at. Um, Facebook, I mostly use just to keep up with family and friends, but I do post a lot of book stuff over there too. Um, but I, I will most, I, I'm most responsive on Instagram. Um, and my email is always a nice way to get in touch too, which you can find that on my website. Um, so on Instagram, I'm author Kayla Olson, O-L-S-O-N, um, unlike the Olson twins. <laughs> um, and then my website is just kaylaolson.com. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And we're going to now go into the question and answer. Awesome. But we really appreciate ha you having here tonight, having you. you here tonight. <laughs> Thank you for having me. This is so much fun. <laughs>